Hello everyone, um, thanks for joining us. Uh, my name is Alan Katz. I'm the director of the Manitoba Centre for Health Policy at the University of Manitoba in Winnipeg, uh, Canada. And um, uh, we're here to do a presentation in partnership with the First Nations Health and Social Secretariat of Manitoba. So I will let uh, Leona Starr introduce herself. Good day, everybody. My name is Leona Starr. I work as the Director of Research, and I'm pleased to be able to sit here with you today to co-present with our partners, um, Dr. Alan Katz with the Manitoba Center for Health Policy. So just to give you a, a brief overview of who we are as First Nations organization, we are a mandated organization by the Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs um, to establish as a standalone entity, an arm's length entity um, to provide support um, to First Nations led research and that relationship that we have with um, the ongoing historical harms as a result of research being undertaken without true partnerships and without the interpretation of First Nations um, people has often led to um, harms as um, indicated by various researchers, including um, as highlighted by um, Mosby in 2013. Um, also based on this partnership, we have had an ongoing relationship with the Manitoba Center for Health Policy since the early 2000s. And I'll let Alan kind of speak to that, how that partnership had originated and how that's kind of shifted to today. So um, the relationship that we developed resulted in an atlas that was published in 2002, looking at the health of First Nations in Manitoba. And it's taken us uh, a long time to get back to repeat that work, uh, even though it was a, something that we should have done earlier. And uh, it's based on data sharing agreements between the Ministry of Health in Manitoba, uh, the Manitoba Centre, and the First Nations Health and Social Secretariat. Uh, the data sharing agreement has resulted in data being added to the Manitoba Population Research Data Repository. The data we hold in that repository is generally administrative data. It's de-identified, um, but we are able to link across the 90 plus different databases that are within the repository to do analyses across people and across time uh, and include uh, many different data sets that include both health and social data. In this slide, the um, data on uh, the right hand, your left hand side of the slide are the ones that were specifically added to uh, the repository for this work. I'm not going to go through the methods in any detail at all. Uh, there's some details presented here on the slide uh, that really are not necessarily uh, for me to uh, read or repeat, you can come back and review this at any, at any time. So one of the key pieces in really undertaking this work is really answering the, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, um, identifying or an, answering one of these calls that, one of 94 calls that were called to action as a result of the harm, the historical harms that were inflicted upon First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people during the area, era of um, residential school, where children were forced to um, forced into institutions, and many of whom had really suffered from many abuses from um, spiritual to um, physical to sexual abuse, and are really still healing from those traumas Specific to the call to action number 19, the commission called for regular annual reports to identify ways or to really provide that evidence in terms of how to close the gaps or how, gap, how big that gap actually was and continues to be. So in answering that call to action, this partnership um, really highlights whether or not that gap between um, the health and well-being of First Nations is actually 
widening or is it closing and what's working and what's not? So just one uh, other slide around some numbers. The Manitoba population at the time was about 1.3 million, of whom 11% were registered First Nations, um, who we are, are, are the people who we have described as First Nations in the report. <clears throat> uh, we compared First Nations to all other Manitobans, and we divided First Nations into on reserve and off reserve, the details of which we are not uh, going into in this presentation. So unfortunately, there is a large gap uh, and the gap is widening. So here on the slide, you see the 2002 comparison in life expectancy at birth between boys and girls in First Nations and all other Manitobans. And the next slide, you, we have added the 2019 results. And you can see that the gap has widened mainly because in all other Manitobans, life expectancy has increased, whereas in First Nations, it has actually stayed the same, or in the case of girls, got one year worse. And this has resulted in a widening of the gap between life expectancy. When we do other comparisons, and we're going to go through these relatively quickly without um, burdening you with a bunch of numbers, um, there are fewer PAP tests done in First Nations, and uh, the cervical cancer rate is higher in First Nations. Probably those two are related. There are five times more suicide attempts amongst First Nations in Manitobans than all other Manitobans. Um, opioids are prescribed more by healthcare practitioners than in all other Manitobans, and this clearly would result in an increase in the risk of dependence. So why is the gap widening? So really trying to understand those underlying factors that have resulted in poverty, that have resulted in these higher rates and why that gap is widening. It's important to really understand the implications of um, racist, uh, excuse me, racist policies and legislation that have been imposed upon Indigenous people within Canada to effectively remove us from our lands and territories and have resulted in the racism, the poor, poor housing, the lack of clean running water, um, and the implications of colonialism has had on this imposition of poverty in terms of um, the impacts on the overall well-being of First Nations um, health. So we also look at um, access and how lack of access to equitable health care um, has greatly impacted the overall, again, the well-being of First Nations people. The further that we have to travel to access health care, um, is really demonstrated in the data that we, we analyze. And as First Nations people, we're actually less likely to see um, that continuity of care that's often um, needed to, to have equitable care, to have consistent care to be seen by the same service provider. When we look at the outcomes of these this report, so we not only wanted to have um, provide that evidence, we want to ensure that the results were being utilized, that the gaps were being addressed. So number one is like continuing to support annual reporting on um, to address these gaps. So we want to have annual reports of the similar atlas. We need to have equitable access to that intervention and prevention measures. Also identifying and addressing racism um, and providing more support for cultural safety and training for all health professionals. Um, and that, that pathway to report um, racism within the healthcare system, because right now there is not, there's no effective way to report um, racism within the healthcare system. And really that's what we're also trying to measure is measuring the racism within the healthcare system in terms of providing those long-term plans for 
for the health, health and well-being um, that support for healthcare professionals. And then supporting further partnerships amongst um, allies and partners, such as the relationship that we have with Mental the Center for Health Policy. And again, improving that quality access to primary health care, regardless of geography. Thank you.